Well, good morning, church family. It's great to see you guys this morning. Uh, my name is Barrett Bowden. I am lead pastor here at Island Community Church, and I want to welcome all of you uh, on this second Sunday of September uh, and the beginning of our fall series. If you haven't heard already, um, now you know. Today we are launching a brand new series and a brand new book study uh, in the life of our church. We are going to be in a series called Brokenness and Hope. And no, it's not about uh, the Alabama football season. Um, If you saw the Alabama-Texas game last night, um, it has nothing to do with anything so surface level such as that. Um, Rather, it is a study of the book of Lamentations. And I just wanted to know right off the bat, first of all, who knew that today we were beginning a new series? Okay, that's decent. How many of you have actually studied ever before the book of Lamentations, personally or with a church? Okay, so it's probably about 10, 20% of us it looked like. Um, I am really excited. It's our typical pattern here at Island Community Church to pick a book of the Bible um, in the fall and also in the spring and to study it. And this year, God has laid on our heart a book of the Bible that is unfamiliar, it seems, to most of you. Uh, Perhaps you've read it in your personal reading plan and the scripture, but perhaps you've never studied it, Um, the book of Lamentations. And so if you don't even know where the book of the Bible is, it's in the Old Testament. Uh, It's sandwiched uh, right behind uh, the book that is called by the most likely author of Lamentations. Anybody know who that is? Jeremiah, that's right. And so if you've got your Bible and you're curious to even try to find the book of Lamentations, I would encourage you to do it right now. It's totally fine. Um, And as you do that, uh, I just want to say this series has been birthed really out of a lot of prayer. Uh, We began praying about what God would have for us to do this fall back in late spring. And we prayed through the summer as an elder team, the women's advisory team. Um, many of our staff leadership and other leadership. And we really sensed out of prayer and the options that were before us that this was the right direction that God wanted for our church uh, for this season. And so I step forward today with great confidence, not because I have picked some clever series or I've got some book of the Bible I just can't wait to teach, but I know that I know that I know that what we're walking in is exactly what God has led us to walk in. And I really have so much confidence and expectation that he's going to meet you, he's going to meet me right here in this book, in this season, for this time. And he's got something for us. And I really feel great hope and expectation for that. I also want to admit that um, this season, this series is resonant for me because in a a very personal way. I'm teaching this out of my own experience of brokenness and hope. This season past, and I'll talk more about this in moments ahead, but has been a season in my own life that has been marked by a lot of pain, has been marked by loss, has been marked by grief, has been a difficult season We also are aware that in this season in Memphis, Tennessee, it feels especially broken right now in this time. We have walked with many of you as you have been honest with us about some of the things that are going on in your hearts and in your lives, things that are going on in our community and city at large, things that are just hard. And so for a variety of reasons, God's leadership, my own story, but also what we sense happening in our church community and in the Memphis community, I feel a lot of hope and anticipation for the opportunity to study this particular book of the Bible together, because I think, it's, I th- I think God's going to meet us right where we are with exactly what we need. And so I just want to say, welcome, <laughs> welcome to uh, this, this new study and journey together. And I I really mean this when I say, I know some of us, when we hear um, about book studies, we get really excited and we, and we, because a lot of us are, are thinking people and we love that. If you're a thinking person and you're intellectual and you love the opportunity to study new books of the Bible and learn more about historical context and more about the verses and the, the framework of the book and all the theology that's within it, all of that is wonderful. And you'll have an opportunity for that in this season, in this study. 
But more than it just being an intellectual exercise for you, the opportunity to grasp new theology or to understand a new book of the Bible, we are praying that this series would be a personally transformative experience with God for you. We really believe that there are new ways that you need to engage with God that you have not engaged with God before, new ways you need to learn Him and trust Him and surrender to Him. We are praying that you might this morning have a, have a personal desire to meet with God in this season in a way that you have it before. And so it's my invitation to you to, to, to just engage and make the most of it. I'm going to put up a slide real quick. This is the only kind of announcement moment of the message, but here's what I'd like to say. There are multiple ways for you to engage in this study and in this series with us in this season. If you have not found a community group, we would love for you to consider either finding a group or even if you're a member to form a new group. Um, many of our community groups in this season will choose to walk alongside with us in this series, whether it's just in prayer times or maybe in the discussion and the prayer time. And it would be a great gift and a needed thing, I really believe, in your life for you to have some other people around you who can journey with you and what God is teaching you week in and week out. Some other things that I would like to encourage you to do is just be present as much as you can on Sundays. Um, and also out in the lobby, we have handpicked, I've got a whole shelf out there of handpicked resources that directly relate to the topic of suffering. And so if you're interested in next steps from this series, I would encourage you to check out that recommended resource uh, area in our, in our lobby. Um, there's also recommendations there that have nothing to do with this series from other leaders, staff members, uh, ministry leaders in our church. And also, I wanted to tell you, I know that in this season, the very title, Brokenness and Hope, is probably going to help you know that we're going to be engaging with some difficult things out of this book of Lamentations. It's just what the book is, and it's part of what God wants for us in this season. Historically, as your pastoral team, we have responded to you when you have made a request of us to go, hey, I need a counseling recommendation. I need somebody to walk with me some things that have surfaced. We typically have reacted when you have asked of us, but we have made a change now. And starting today, uh, I'm happy to announce that we now have proactively gone ahead and put out on our church website for you uh, counseling recommendations here in the community. And so if there are areas that surface up in this season um, where you recognize you really need a partner to walk with you, and to move, help to, in a skilled way, move you uh, toward the Lord and toward healing and restoration in ways. We just want to let you know that those recommendations are now on our website. You can all, always reach out to us pastorally, but I also want you to know that there's a way you can go and pull that information without even having to email and wait for us to respond. So it's going to be a great season. We're really looking forward to it. Um, there's an outline I want to put up on the screen. This series is going to be taking us, and if you can't read that, I apologize, but it's going to be taking us basically through the end of November. We'll be taking a few weeks off at the end of October uh, to, to focus on some things that we need to do every single year and we get to do as it relates to emphasizing our work in the local community. But basically, if you're journeying with us in this fall season, week in and week out, we will be together in this series. So this morning, I want to start, if you're taking notes, and I hope you will. I want to start um, with basically a week of introduction. Some of you this morning came thinking, I'm so excited. We get to start studying Lamentations. And I have some news for you. We're not even going to look at a chapter one. We're not even going to start today. <laughs> How about that? We are going to look at a few verses. But today, what we're going to do is actually frame up why we as a pastoral team believe this series is even needed. So today's message, if you're taking notes, I hope you will, is called Discovering Lament as Grace. Discovering Lament as Grace. Um, I want to start by just admitting to you something that I don't really talk about a whole lot. I don't talk about it a whole lot from this platform to you. I really don't talk about it a whole lot in general. And I'm sorry for that. I'll explain more of my apology in a second. Life is really hard.
The older I have gotten, the more I've had to come to terms with the fact that life is just hard at times. And pain in life is a real thing. And I don't just mean like surface level pain. I mean deep pain. Woundedness. Like heart aches. My life, in many ways, I would say today, has been hard. And there is pain in my heart that is real and deep. And I just want to throw something else out there. (laughs) The world is really broken. It just is. Waking up yesterday to news of an earthquake in Morocco. This morning learning 2,000. I mean, it just feels like yesterday we had that news in Istanbul. If y'all remember us praying for that as a church. Friday afternoon, more shootings downtown. Last night, 3.30 in the morning, I wake up straight up in my bed. Eight gunshots blocked from my house. Cars screeching. I'm like, dang, <laughs> Not the way to wake up. What do you do with that? Losing friends, loved ones to cancer. Experiencing betrayals of relationship. Looking around and going like, man, why, why do the best people seem to like suffer the most? Like, it just feels broken sometimes. And the longer, it's not just me getting older, it's me having followed Jesus longer, that I need to tell you something. Following Jesus involves suffering. It does. I mean, you can trust Jesus in all the right ways. You can really surrender to him. You can take seriously the things that he asks. And it seems at times that the deeper you trust and the more you obey, the more it costs you. The more that circumstantially you go, dang, like that sucked. Doing all the right things and suffering. Kind of like the song, like sea billows rolls. There are some days and some seasons in my life, and I'm dipping out of my bucket here. I'm not trying to dip into yours. I'm talking about me. So just listen to me for a second, and we'll get to the scripture, all right? But there are some days and some seasons in my life that I have to admit to you. It has felt like there are more questions than answers. Or it has felt like there are more tears in my eyes than a natural smile on my face. There have been moments where I've walked into this church and I have had to put on a smile for you. But on the inside, I have not felt smiley. I have felt achy. There have been moments and seasons that have felt much more like a valley than a mountaintop. And to be honest, though I know that it is not true theologically, because I know that I'm a person of hope, There have been moments and seasons where it has felt like there has been more darkness than light. Some of these things you've probably known about. Some of y'all who have walked with me for a long time, you know about some of these things. But there are a lot of these things you probably don't. And 
And it's hard sometimes when you know that people know you in certain ways, but in other ways they don't know you. And I'm sure you probably resonate with that. It's hard sometimes when you feel like you're suffering in silence. And there's been many times in my life where I have suffered in silence, where I've carried pain and grief and loss, but I've done it very privately. And honestly, that has left me, in many ways, feeling empty. It's left me, in many ways, feeling disillusioned. It's left me in many ways feeling discouraged. It's left me in many ways feeling hurt. And it certainly has left me feeling alone. There have been questions that have rolled through my mind, have kept me awake in the middle of the night, have caused me in moments to feel almost emotional paralysis in the middle of the day, where you ask big questions about the things that are happening in, in your life, why? why? Why me? What has gone wrong? And more importantly, what do I do with this? What do I do with this with God? What do I do with this with, with others? How, how do I even relate to myself in this? What is going on? And what am I supposed to do? Suffering and silence. Today's message is discovering lament as grace, right? Now, I told you a second ago I was dipping out of my bucket. But now I want to dip out of yours. What about you? like your most honest self, like pain? Is there pain in you? Have you been wounded? Are you hurting? Are there areas in your own heart where you're going, I I just don't know if God is dot, dot, dot. I I don't know where God has been in dot, dot, dot. Or you're wrestling with questions that don't seem to have answers. Are there disappointments in your life? Like things that you had really hoped for and they're not happening. At least not yet. You're not even sure if they will. The things from your childhood, from your adolescence, things in your present, it just feels hard. (laughs) Where are their frustrations? Where is their loss? I mean, a real sense of loss. Where is their hurt? My apology that I said I wanted to come back to a second ago is is twofold. Uh, One is... personally have not always been the best at dealing with hard things and engaging and suffering personally. But it's also, the second part of my apology is it's also extended into my pastoral ministry. I, I don't think that I have led our church well to just give space to live in hard places. To just sit in grief. 
to corporately even know how to express these things. And I certainly have not ever taught a series like I'm about to teach to try to walk you through how to relate to God in the midst of darkness and suffering. And I'm sorry, because I know that that has cost us in ways as a community. But I wonder today, where are you? Perhaps it's abuse. Perhaps it's unanswered prayers. Perhaps it's betrayal. People in your life, maybe it's your parent, a caregiver has disappointed you. Someone in your life who had committed to you and they didn't make good on their promise. And it hurts. As a result, you can't trust. Maybe it's people around you who you love who are suffering deeply. Or even people around you who are hurting you deeply. Maybe it's injustice that you faced. Maybe it's rejection. Maybe it's you feeling undesirable or worthless. Maybe it's humiliation in some way in your life where you've received disapproval, you've received harsh criticism unfairly. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's some affliction of some other kind. Where is there pain in your life? could be all the way back from when you were three, four years old. It could be all the way up to the present, something that happened last night. Elizabeth Elliot, great missionary. Of course, we know uh, Elizabeth and Jim, their story probably well. Sacrificed greatly for the Lord. But she says, I'm not a theologian or a scholar, but I am very aware of the fact that pain is necessary to all of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Paul himself rattles off this hero of faith, and yet he speaks of the pain of life, afflicted in every way, not crushed, perplexed. Big questions. Not driven to despair, persecuted, not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. We like to focus sometimes on, oh, but look, oh, but look. See, the, see all the hopeful things that he's talking about, but my word, do you, do you see what he's also telling you? He's basically saying to you, life has been hard. I have been afflicted in every way. I have had So many days where there's more questions than answers. I just felt like people are coming against me and life is coming against me. There have been times where I've just been knocked flat out, breathless, struck down. In my body, I feel like death. This is honest. And what I'm asking you is, what about you? I believe the brokenness is real. But I believe many of us are asking the questions, what do we do with it? How do we engage it with God and with others? And even how do we know ourselves in the midst of it? My hope is that none of us, after this season, will be left suffering in silence. I believe there are many of us Today, there's corners of darkness, there's places of hurt, there's areas of woundedness, and many of us are carrying that in silence. But it is my prayer that after the season and after our study of Lamentations that we will no longer have to suffer in silence. And here's why. Because God 
wants to meet us in these spaces. There's a reason that we're calling this series Brokenness and Hope. And it's because the journey of this book begins in brokenness. And we'll start the journey next week, okay? It begins in brokenness, but it doesn't stay in brokenness. It moves to hope. But the reason that it moves to hope is because in the midst of the brokenness, we learn how to actually engage God and how to engage others and how to engage ourselves. And, and we actually learn how to move toward God in the deepest and darkest places of our pain. Lament. All right? This is going to be a word that we use a lot. So if you've got your notes this morning, I want you to go ahead and write this word down, circle it, whatever you need to do. Lament. All right? The title of today's message is Discovering Lament is Grace. And here's why. Lament, of course, coming from Lamentations, right? So this is the book of laments, okay? Lament is a needed and often undiscovered grace. What I want to teach you in this season is that when we learn to engage God in the midst of our pain, when we actually learn to bring our pain and suffering to God, there is an opportunity for grace. Unbelievable grace. God meets us in these places, a deep grace that carries weight. God wants to meet us with grace. But I truly believe that it's an often undiscovered grace. Because we often don't know what to do with our pain. I think lament is a missing grace in the church today. Um, many of us are unfamiliar with what to even do with lament. We're uncomfortable with it. Um, have you ever been through a struggle and gone to another Christian and tried to like talk to another Christian about your struggle? To like have a deep, dark area of your life, a really painful place, and you go and try to take it to another Christian, okay? Probably most of us have experienced this. You've probably also experienced one of the most unfortunate things that happens in the Christian church, if you've ever done that. And that is that a Christian, a really well-meaning Christian, perhaps could have looked at you, heard you out, and then tried to quickly move you to the bright side. Anybody ever had a Christian do that to you before? Okay. <laughs> so essentially, um, they'll, they'll try to find the silver lining or they'll quickly change the subject or there might be an awkward silence and they just look at you and quickly walk away. Perhaps that's happened to you too. Um, I've had this happen to me before where I've gone, taken a lot of courage talked about something, and then had somebody preach at me. Give me a quick solution. Or had somebody almost minimize what I was trying to express because they started comparing it to their own suffering and their own pain. Well-meaning, well-meaning. But they wanted me to know I wasn't alone, so they began to tell about how they suffered too. Not the most helpful. Or perhaps someone takes what you share confidentially and they turn around and make it a prayer request at their community group next week. Perhaps you've had some tragic event happen, like a car wreck. You've got deep anxiety. You're losing sleep. You tell somebody about it. They go, but look, you survived. Not helpful. Thank you. Or you express anxiety about going on a run in your neighborhood alone because of stuff that's happening here in Memphis. And somebody responds, there's no need to be afraid. Forget it. God's not given you a spirit of fear. Seriously. Thank you very much. You're battling infertility. 
And in moments of attempted comfort, people say things like, I'm just sure the Lord will give you another baby. You're struggling with the loss of a loved one. People come up and go, I just believe more people are going to come to Jesus because they died. Perhaps you've been in a situation before and you're literally at a point of anguish. A situation that feels totally unbearable. And somebody comes up and they go, the Lord must have known that you could be trusted with this. Oh. Lament. A missing grace in the church today. Again, well-meaning people. Perhaps you've been one of these people, somebody else in your life. We can appreciate any Christian's attempt to help us in the midst of our pain, but it is clear that many of us do not know how to be with God in the midst of our grief. We don't know how to just sit in pain and let God sit with us in that place of pain. And it is a grace that is needed in our lives. And it is a grace that is needed in our church. So you wonder today, is he ever going to get to scripture? <laughs> yes, I am. You ready? I'm going to set up the series in this way. I just, I, I just, it's a very simple thing. I want for you to understand what lamentations, lamentations, all right, what this book is all about. Lament is the wailing of the heart before God. For you to understand lament, here's what you got to understand. You bring your hurting heart to God. That is it. Lament is the wailing of the heart before God. And here's why this is so important. It's because lament is the pathway that God has provided for us to respond to grief. It is God's chosen pathway. It's the prescription that the doctor gives when we go in and we're like, I'm hurting. And he's like, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring your hurts to me. That, that's kind of like a prescription, right? So like, if you look at the Bible, and we're going to do it a lot in the next months, but the biblical prescription for grief is lament. It is the pathway for us to respond when we're grieving. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this in Scripture. One of them is this. 65, around 65 of the Psalms, depending on how you count them, what you look for, we'll look at this more next week. But around 65 of the Psalms, that's almost half of the Psalms in the Bible, these are songs to God, honest expressions of the heart, right? How do we bring our hearts to God? The Psalms teach us. Well, y'all, about half of them are laments. What's that tell you? That it's okay to pray when you don't have all the answers. In fact, it's needed. It's okay to pray when there's more tears than smiles. In fact, it's needed. It's okay to bring your heart to God when it feels more dark than light. In fact, it's needed. It's okay to come to God when you're like, God, I am in a valley and I miss the mountaintop. How long, oh Lord, will you leave me here? It's okay to pray like that. In fact, it's needed. Almost half of the heart cries of the scripture in the book of Psalms our cries, our wails of the heart to God in the midst of pain. God is inviting us to see how much we need to engage him in all of these places of hurt. Past, present, and even preparation for the future. Psalms like Psalm 13, we'll come back to this at a later date, but Psalms like Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord, Will you forget me? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? I 
Consider me and answer me, O Lord. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I've prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. What do you hear in this psalm? Is it a nice, happy ending? Not necessarily. Your honest wails of heart. God, where are you? God, why am I going through this? God, have you forgotten me? God, I'm hurting here, please. God, answer me. It feels like dark. It feels like death. Oh, God, would you bring light? Would you lift up my eyes? God, I am a mess. Lament. God's chosen pathway for you in the midst of grief. Another psalm that we know very well, that we love very much, starts with, the Lord is my shepherd. Y'all know the song, Psalm 23? But the core middle of the psalm, verses 4 and 5, are what? Even though I walk through the valley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? Death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and their staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my what? Enemies. The honesty of the psalm. God, there are times where I just, I go through valleys, God. There are times where it feels like death, God. There are times where it feels like things are coming against me, God. But God, I'm not going to stop engaging you from where I am. That is learning Lament. Lament is how we bring our sorrow to God. Lament is how we bring our sorrow to God. And I want to tell you, Jesus frequently lamented. Frequently lamented. He looked over at Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. <laughs> Crying out. John chapter 11, if you've got your Bible, you can turn there. I haven't asked you to turn a lot of places, but John chapter 11 is one place you can turn. We'll come back to Lamentations. I know I asked you to turn there. We'll come back to it. Now you found it. You know how to find it again. John chapter 11. Starting in verse 33, it's the story of Jesus after he hears the news of Lazarus. Lazarus, his friend, dear friend, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, all of them very close to Jesus, hung out with them all the time. Jesus was away in another town ministering. News came to him that Lazarus was sick. He got the news, waited several more days, then made his way to where Martha, Mary, Lazarus were. He arrives and gets news that Lazarus is dead. He knows, he knows that he intends to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows that as soon as he raises Lazarus from the dead, the crowds are going to turn against him. They're going to want to kill him. It was that act that actually got Jesus crucified. Jesus himself would take the place of Lazarus in the tomb, guarantee that those who trust in Jesus, like Lazarus, would also be raised from the dead. He knows the end of the story is a story of hope, a story of hope because of who he is and a story of hope because what he would do in his life and in his death for us and in his resurrection from the grave. Jesus knows the end of the story is hope. He's about to walk in and change everything. But he doesn't bypass the pathway to it. Verse 33, Jesus saw her weeping. And the Jews who had come with her also weeping. And he was deeply moved in his spirit. And he was greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, 
Come, see. We find the next verse, the shortest, and I think one of the most profound verses in the scripture. Two words, Jesus wept. He didn't bypass engaging God in the midst of his pain to quickly get to hope. He chose to take the pain that he felt and to express it honestly before God and before others. And in that expression, God led to hope. But the pathway for it was the honest admission, the wailing of the heart before God. Jesus wept. And in verse 38 it says, Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Deeply moved. It's like Jesus is like expressing to us the fullness of what humanity is all about. Even humanity lived in perfection of godliness. To be a human is to know brokenness and to know pain and to know hurt. But rather than pretend like it doesn't hurt, rather than pretend like it's not real, Jesus goes like, Oh, I hate death. Jesus rages against death. It's not the way it should be. The world is broken. And he sees death of his friend and he rages against it. And he weeps. Because in life, relationships of love should last. That was God's design. So to have a relationship of love be cut off hurts like hell. And Jesus goes, This is hard. I miss my friend. And he shows us. He helps us to see that it is good and it is godly to grieve. It is good and it is godly to grieve. Lament is like a bridge that connects us from the brokenness of the world that we live in into the very presence of God that we so desperately need. And we desperately need to know how to connect with him. And lament is the bridge that he builds for us. And he invites us in. I'll give you another example, a final example in Jesus' life. It's Jesus in Gethsemane. If you think about Jesus in Gethsemane, you can see this picture of what it looks like to be present with God in pain. Matthew chapter 26, if you've got your Bible, which you've already got open to John, you can flip back of your books to Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, looking at verse 38. He says, Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. If you go to verse 42, it says again, for the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. This is Jesus, hours before he is taken captive as a prisoner, before he is humiliated in public, tried unjustly, whipped, mocked, scorned, hung on a cross to bear the sins of you, and me, and all who would repent of sin and trust in him for salvation. This is our Savior who's humbling himself and he's facing complete loss. He's in total darkness, literally, in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
He's bent over and heaves. He's got sweat pouring out like blood. And he's choosing not to bypass it. He's not getting out. He knows where he is in the pit and he's willing to be there with God. He's willing to feel it. My soul is sorrowful. He's admitting to God. He's admitting to his disciples, to his friends. I am not okay right now. I am not okay. Again and again, if you read the passage later, he, he goes and gets them. Will you just come and be with me? Because like this is not okay. I'm hurting. My soul feels like death. I'm, I'm being poured out. I don't, I don't know how much more I can take. Oh God, would you take this from me? This is Jesus, not skipping over the moment, not ignoring or pretending like he's fine. No, he's not skirting the pain. He's present with God in the darkness, and he's present with God in the pain. This is Jesus. And let me tell you something. All of us, okay, in a very different way, don't hear me try to make you a savior, because you're not. But in the sense of being In darkness and in pain, all of us face our own Gethsemanes. All of us face our own Gethsemanes. I recently read on my summer reading list this year, it was a book called All My Knotted Up Life. It was written by Beth Moore. Um, It was a book that uh, many had talked about to me and I really wanted to read regardless of if you know Beth Moore or what you think about her, I would like to recommend the book to you because it was a profound spiritual experience for me, helped me greatly as she was processing her life with God, helped me to process my own life with God. But there's a section of one of the chapters in the book where she talks about her husband's experience in darkness and in pain. And she talks about an enduring trauma that he had related to being a child with his brother in a garage when they accidentally filled their toy gas lawnmower up with real gasoline. A spark happened in the garage. Flame was lit. His little brother burned to death in front of his own eyes. He lived. His brother did not. And the rest of his life, he carried with him trauma, darkness, and pain. Beth describes as she found out about what had happened to her husband. Her husband couldn't really talk about it, so she went back in history and looked at newspaper clippings from that event. And she saw in the newspaper that there had been an article published that said that the burial of this little child, her husband's brother, would take place in a church. That cemetery was called the Garden of Gethsemane. She writes in the book, quote, From the article, burial will be in the Garden of Gethsemane. But then, Beth, you could take this down for just a second, because this is not what I'm about to read. Then Beth says this, describing the Gethsemane that we all face. And I wonder if you might relate. She says, the place of pleading and pores bleeding. The place where you enter in with Jesus and crawl on your hands and knees and fall on your face before God, begging for the cup of suffering to pass by you. But the chalice is so close to you now and the moon is so full, you can see your reflection in the gold. Your face is contorted with dread, with the whites of your eyes luminous with horror. Not everyone comes out. Burial will be in the Garden of Gethsemane. She describes burial in the dirt that you dug up, bruising your knees, begging. In the place where those who believe come at their rawest, skinless, vulnerable, powerless, hopelessly dependent self, thrown at the mercy of a God that they hope is listening. It is there that the petitioner sobs, I won't live through this if this cup doesn't pass. Do what you're going to do, God. Do your will. Do it above my own because you alone are God. But I know that I cannot, I will not come out of this alive. She describes about her husband, Keith. Keith and his mom got buried there with Duke 
the brother in the garden of Gethsemane. The one in cotton swaddling clothes, freed from pain and made whole in the presence of God, cuddled unafraid and set down, his blonde hair tussled by the hand of God and loose to play. But the other two of them were buried alive. There would be no play. Others in the family grieved, but these two would never recover. Then she says this, you can put on the screen. Gethsemane is all the things we fear most except one. We fear that we are unheard. We're sure of it, but it's not true. It was in that original Gethsemane that Jesus, in the words of Hebrews 5, 7, offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard. And friends, we are too. We are too. I close today by asking a question, and this is the question that I need you as our church family, my friends, to wrestle with before we launch this series. This is why I'm teaching this today before I'm just jumping into a study of Lamentations 1. This series, this study, will not be helpful for you unless you choose to respond to this question in a Godward way. How will you respond in your suffering? How will you respond in your suffering? And here are your choices. Will you engage God in it? Or will you rage against it? Will you engage God in it? Or will you rage against it? Tim Keller described, I I had to go back and find it. I remember hearing it years ago and I went back and sourced it and thankfully found it on a distant audio podcast. I transcribed it and I'll say it now to you. But he described, as he was thinking back over the ministry that he had had at Redeemer Church in New York City and before that another state, he said over years of ministry, he and his wife had found that it was interesting about suffering. One of the main reasons that people lost their faith in God was because of suffering. Over and over, people say, I'd lost faith in God because of the painful thing that I went through. And yet, at the same time, over and over and over, people would come and say, one of the main reasons that I have found faith in God, and one of the main reasons that I have grown and been strengthened in my faith in God is because of my suffering. And he said, often, he had pastored long enough to hear people describe the exact same sufferings And some had lost faith in God over that, and some had found faith or grown in faith in God over that. And he came to this conclusion. He says, therefore, suffering as an experience does not do anything for you, does not do anything to you, but it's what you tell yourself about it, or namely what happens within you during it that moves you one way or the other. Will you engage God in it, or will you rage against it? Your response is key. It could even make you a more hard person or a more tender-hearted person. It can make you a prouder person or a more humble person. It can make you more open to help or more close to everyone else. How will you respond to these places of hurt and darkness and pain? kind of like a garden where ground has been broken up. Suffering in many ways is like a breaking of the ground in our hearts, isn't it? But the question is, once the ground has been broken up, what gets planted there determines what will grow from there. And what gets planted there is namely directed by whether or not you will choose to wail, let your heart wail toward God and with God, or whether or not you will close your heart to God. And the invitation of this 
book of Lamentations and of Scripture at large and of my heart to you today is would you be willing to open up some of these dark corners of your heart, these deep wounds of your life, these present experiences of pain, these hurts, these disappointments, these frustrations, these questions, would you be willing in some new area in this season to just open up some of that to God? How will you respond and suffering. I'm telling you, if you don't respond well, you're going to get bitterness. You're going to get resentment. You're going to get anger. You're going to get grumbling. You're going to get isolation. You're going to get discontentment. You could even get depression. But if you respond toward God, I believe there is grace. There is trust, there is intimacy, there is goodness, there is faith that can come. Tim Keller, the quote that you just saw on the screen, one of the main ways that we move from abstract knowledge about God to a personal encounter with him in a living reality is through the furnace of affliction. And to quote the Elizabeth, to finish the Elizabeth Elliot quote earlier, she says, I'm not a theologian or a scholar, but I'm aware that pain is necessary to all of us. And then she goes on and says, in my own life, I think I can honestly say that out of the deepest pain has come the strongest conviction of the presence of God and of the love of God. Lamentations 3 that Tad read just before I came to speak. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. Honesty about brokenness. But a direction of hope, but this I call to mind and therefore have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the Lord. My invitation to you today is the invitation of Jesus. And I don't know how you're going to respond. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As we close today and our worship team comes to respond, here's what I want you to consider. You know those like rope things that sometimes keep you out of places that you're not supposed to be. Sometimes I think in our hearts, it's almost like we put up a rope and we, we kind of put up a do not enter sign in a certain places of our heart and life, especially the ones that are the most painful. There are big barriers to entry, big stiff arm over many places, I believe, of our heart and life, of our minds, of our past, even our present. God is inviting you today. Hey, would you you just unclip the rope and just move it to the side and would you let me in? Would you just let me change that stiff arm to, to one of just receiving and embrace? Would you be willing to just take down the sign that says, don't come near, and, and would you just let me be with you in the midst of this? Will you let your heart wail in my presence? That's the invitation of today, of the season ahead. But you've got to make the choice. How will you respond? Father, I pray that you will allow your Holy Spirit to work in such a way that today we would know that we are loved by you. Lord, that you move toward us in our pain and you want to be near to us where we are hurting. Lord, right now you are inviting us, come to me, those who are weary and heavy laden, whether that weariness is of some past season or of some present experience, God, there is weariness in each of us and your Holy Spirit knows it. And that's why today you are saying right here and right now, come to me in your pain. Bring your honest self, your raw self, your hurting self your scraped up and wounded self. You're frustrated and angry and disillusioned and questioning self. Bring your honest self to me. Come to me, all who are weary and all who are heavy laden. 
I'm here. I want to give you rest. Oh, Holy Spirit, would we come? Would we respond to you? Please, right here, right now, would we just make the choice? God, I'm going to let you in. I'm going to let you be with me. I'm going to engage. Oh, Father, would you give grace? Would you give grace, Lord? Even though we walk through the valley, you're with us. You comfort us. Even in the presence of enemies, Lord, you put a table before us. You anoint our head with oil. Jesus, you came for us. You live for us. You died for us. There's grace sufficient for us. You're coming again for us. There's hope at the end. But Lord, right now we need you in the present. So Father, just, just cause us to come. As we sing this song, church family, our elders, some other ministry leaders in our church, women's advisory and others are going to be up, for, up front as prayer counselors today, as well as our prayer team. At the end of each aisle, you'll find someone. If you want to come forward this morning and pray with someone, please do that. The altar is open as well. Let's let God love on us as we sing the words of this song. Let's respond to him by choosing to invite him near. Thank you again for watching this Bible teaching from Island Community Church. We want to encourage you to join us in person for worship soon. For more information about our worship gatherings, gospel resources, and ways to connect with ICC, you can visit us at iccmemphis.com or download our Owling Community Church app. As we close, we offer a prayer of blessing for you from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.